So we are really glad to have uh, Ben Green from Oxford today and he'll tell us about associativity testing. Okay, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, let me begin by just introducing the kind of question I want to talk about. So let X be a finite set and suppose that you have on that set a binary operation. So it's a, it's a map circle, X cross X maps to X. Um, and I will assume that it's injective in each variable separately, just uh, for definiteness. And I'm going to be interested in what you can say about such an operation when it's associative some fraction of the time, but not all of the time. So when you have this associativity relation, X circle brackets Y circle Z equals brackets X circle Y circle Z, a proportion eta of the time, where eta here is some number between zero and one. And the obvious question is, to what extent does such a condition force this binary operation to resemble a group operation? Of course, it, if X is a group with the operation being multiplication, then this relation happens 100% of the time. Now, I want to give a bit of motivation for specific to this particular audience um, about why I came to care about this sort of question. There are a couple of different answers to that, um, but here's, here's one. The following is one of my favorite open problems. So it, this, this is the question. I have a finite set of points in the plane of size n. And for the sake of definiteness, let's say that there are no four of those points on a line, but there are many triples on a line. So there are at least delta n squared pairs, x, y, and x cross x, for which there's a third point z on the line x, y. So there are many collinear triples. And the question is, I mean, the question is really to say anything non-trivial at all about this situation. But what I think might well be true is that there's some positive proportion of this set, call it x primed, which lies on a cubic curve. Um, actually, nothing even vaguely like that is known. I think it's even still open whether there are 10 of these points that lie on a cubic curve. 10 being an important number in this context because any nine points will lie on a cubic curve. Uh, I'll come back to why cubic curves are important in a second, but this, um, this problem is very reminiscent of work that I think quite a few of you will know about. This is work of Barak, Tvir, Avi, and Yehuda Hayov from 10 years or so ago which was then updated a bit by, by Tavir and Saraf and, and Avi a couple of years later. This is work on rank bounds for design matrices with applications in combinatorial geometry. So they proved the following theorem. Actually, they proved something a bit more precise than this, but this is the flavor of what they proved. Suppose you have a finite set X that's just in any Euclidean space, so not in the plane, but in some potentially very high dimensional space. Again, it has size N, and again, let's say that it has no four points on a line. And once again, let's assume that there's a large number of collinear triples, delta n squared of them. And then what they prove is that there's a, a positive density subset x primed of this set x, whose dimension is bounded polynomially, in fact, in terms just of this parameter delta. So there's no n dependence on this dimension. So you can see there's, there's a very suggestive relationship between these two problems. And I, I'd been thinking about the, the first problem already when this work in computer science came out. And it, I was initially somewhat optimistic that one might be able to use it to prove the, um, the, the problem in the plane, but nobody's ever been able to do that. So why cubic curves? Why are they relevant? Um, well, as I expect most people know, there's this group law on a cubic curve. So collinearity on a cubic curve, um, provided it's sufficiently non-singular. So if it's non-singular elliptic curve, you have this group law defined by collinearity. So you define P plus Q plus R to be zero whenever P, Q and R are collinear. And the highly non-trivial fact is that this operation is associative. And so by taking finite subgroups of cubic curves, which certainly will exist, um, you can create examples of finite point sets in the plane with many, many collinear triples. 
And so that's why cubic curves come into it. Now, what's this got to do with somewhat associativity? Well, let's, I've just restated here what the problem that I am interested in is. Here is a very, very rough idea for a strategy that you could contemplate. So if you've got a set of points with many collinear triples, it's tempting to define a sort of partial binary operation from x cross x to x, basically by defining x circle y to be, or, or rather the inverse of that, whatever that should mean, to be the other point z on the line. Um, so quite often there will be another point z on the line. And then one feels that maybe this ought to be somehow partially associative. Maybe one can prove that just from the combinatorial data that there are many collinear triples. And then maybe from that, you might be able to relate it to a group operation and hence put things on a cubic curve. Now, as it turns out, I basically don't know how to do any part of this strategy whatsoever. But that's sort of what motivated me to be interested in these sort of questions. Now, the other thing that got me interested in partial associativity is the much more recent work by Gowers and Long, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, before I go on, are there any questions so far? I can't actually see anybody because I've somehow... Uh, let me ask one question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when, when delta is really close to one, then uh, do we know, or bigger than half, then do we know the answer? I think not for not for the geometric question. Okay. So Terry Tao and I had some work from 10 years or so ago, which would give you a positive answer when delta is really, really close to one, by which I mean something like one minus constant over n. But even when delta is 0.99, I'm pretty sure that I don't know how to say anything particularly interesting about this. Okay. And may I ask in the in the motivation question from the elliptic curves, the commutativity is part of the game. Yes. Uh, in your general question, is there an assumption of commutativity to start with, or you start uh, kind of no, black? indeed. Right. This is a very relevant question. Um, so what I'm the main content of my talk is going to be an example of a somewhat somewhat associative operation which does not look like a group operation. However, the example will be highly, will, will certainly be non-commutative. And I suspect, um, and I sort of, I, I think Gowers and Long have some follow-up work that I've not seen all of on this, but with an abelian assumption, probably those sort of examples don't exist. Uh, so the, the, the strategy, the sort of very vague strategy I've outlined for the points and lines question is not obviously hopeless is what I'm saying, because you do have this additional abelian assumption. Mm -hmm. But in talking about partial associativity, I'm definitely not assuming anything abelian going on. OK, I shall move on. Um, yeah, so that, that was, as I say, some motivation, at least partially for the benefit of people in the audience who were involved in those collinearity papers, which I'm very fond of. So let's get back to the question itself. I have a finite set X, a binary operation, which is reasonably injective in each variable. With positive probability, you have this associativity relation. So if you pick randomly pick X, Y, and Z in this set X, associativity will happen with prob uh, some positive probability eta. And we want to know to what extent does this resemble a group operation. Now for this question, there is a positive result uh, which has never been published. Uh, Elav Levy, who is a student of Hrushovsky, has a manuscript, which I've, I've seen doing this. And Michael Larson also showed me since years ago a manuscript doing exactly the same thing. And in what I believe computer scientists like to call the unique decoding regime, so where this ether is very, very close to one, it can be shown that an operation, a binary operation like this, does agree with a group operation most of the time. Now, Gowers and Long looked at this question, and they were interested much more in the case where eta is something like 0 0.01. Let's call it the list decoding regime. And they showed, they established a positive result, which I'll not state formally, but I'll hint at, which is weaker than 
this operation being close to a group operation, they show that it's close in a kind of metric sense to a group operation. I'll give an example that shows what's meant by that rather than trying to state their result completely. So actually here is that example. And I'm going to be, throughout a lot of the talk, I'm going to be referencing this example, which takes place in the group SO3, the three by th the rotations in three dimensional Euclidean space, orthogonal rotations. So this is three by three matrices, which are orthogonal with determinant one. I'm going to be talking about it a lot. So we'll denote the group operation just by juxtaposition. And there are quite a lot of different ways of defining a metric on it. Uh, I will just for definiteness fix what's called the Frobenius norm or the Hilbert Schmidt norm on this and use that to define a metric. And this is SO3. And it also has a normalized Haar measure. It's a compact group. And I'll call that mu and I'll write E for the identity. So this is a well-known object. And Gowers and Long, as, as a, an example of what I mean by close to a group operation in a metric sense, let me show you an example Gowers and Long defined. And this I call rounding to a net in SO3. So take a small parameter delta and take a maximal delta separated subset of SO3. Uh, so I didn't say actually SO3 is a three dimensional space. There are these three Euler angles or something that define what a rotation is. And so maximal de delta separated set will have size roughly delta to the minus three. And then you can define the following kind of funny binary operation. You define X circle Y, where little x and little y are in this set capital X, it's the nearest point in this net, if you like, to the actual product x times y. And if there happens to be a tie, you break it arbitrarily. Um, now, as a consequence of the fact that capital X is maximally delta separated, there will always be a point of capital X within a distance delta of the product x, y. So we always have that the distance between x circle y and x times y is at most delta. And this is what I mean by, in a metric sense, this circle operation is close to the group operation on SO3. So what Gowers and Long proved, a bit complicated to state precisely, but what they proved is that essentially every somewhat associative operation looks a bit like this. Obviously not in SO3, um, but with another metric group out there and you, you define an operation somewhat similarly to this. Uh, ben? Yes. Yeah, so a question. So in their result, uh, at least in this example, but I guess in the general result, uh, this will be true for all pairs, not just for many pairs in X. Yeah, so this particular operation is, is definitely defined for all pairs. What I'm about to say is it, it will sometimes be associative, but not always. Um, actually, this particular operation is not injective in each variable separately, but it's sort of, it almost is. It is up to, I don't know, a factor of 10 or something. You never get too many different pre-images. So it's, mor it's morally an example of the kind that I'm interested in. Mm, okay. Now, when you say that there is a group like that, you still mean kind of a compact uh, Lie group, or it's just a very abstract metric group, which comes. Yeah, up it's in it's not as not as precise as 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 a finite dimensional Lie group. I, I've I don't have to have the exact statement that they get, but yeah, I don't, I'm not even sure that they put any doubling constraints or anything on their metric actually. Um, I'm not completely sure that the exact statement is kind of complicated, but this is sort of, it's saying that every approximate, associ approximately associated operation is sort of, comes from examples that look somewhat like this. But yeah, definitely not as strong as a Lie group. Okay. This work of Gauss and Long, by the way, is very interesting. I, um, it's, it's available on the archive. I would thoroughly recommend a look at it. So what they, what they proved in that paper is that this associativity relation does hold 
for a positive fraction of all triples. And that's kind of natural because you, you'd sort of expect the, the group operation on SO3, of course, is associative. And you'd expect this uh, circle operation to inherit some of that associativity. And indeed it does. Although the proof is not, not straightforward at all, it involves some harmonic analysis on SO3 actually to prove that. And what they conjectured is that this particular operation that they've defined do, does not agree with a genuine group operation on any large portion of the set X. So in other words, you can have a somewhat, as, somewhat associative operation, which does not have any piece that looks like a group operation. And it's this that I, I want to discuss a proof of in this talk. So are there any more questions on this basic construction of rounding to a net? Okay. Right, so my theorem is the following. This has now appeared in Bulletin of the London Mathematical Society. Suppose you have a maximal delta separated subset of SO3 and that you define this rounding operation circle. Suppose that iota is an injective map into a group G. And I'll denote the group operation on G with a little dot. Then the conclusion is that this cannot really respect, it can't see too much of this binary operation circle. So the number of pairs x1, x2, for which iota x1 dot iota x2 equals iota of x1 circle x2 is at most epsilon times the size of x squared, where here epsilon tends to zero as delta tends to zero. So what this is saying, I'm hypothesizing an embedding iota from x into some group G, and I'm saying that that embedding cannot respect very much of this binary operation circle. So in that precise sense, that binary operation does not look like, does not come from a group operation. There is, there is no assumption on G being finite. Absolutely not. No, G could be anything at all. Can you say what this means when just G is SO3 itself? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, when G is SO3 itself, there an, an iota is just the identity yeah. inclusion. Yeah, I mean, this, this then this will basically never happen. It will never happen that x1 times x2 is equal to x1 circle x2. So another way of saying that is that that implies, for instance, that there do not exist finite sets x that are even weakly closed under multiplication in SO3. So in other yeah. words, the rounding, the rounding operation really does move things. You can't, have a, you can't choose your net, your, your delta separated subset, in such a way that the rounding operation often rounds back into the set, it, um, that, that the, the unrounded product x times y is in the set x. That won't happen. That's what it says. Okay. I have a question about the order of quantifiers, I guess. Uh, in the geometric example you, you gave uh, in the beginning as motivation, uh, it seemed reasonable to let the large piece which has structure uh, to have size, uh, fractional size, which depends on the fraction you are given, given in the beginning, which is, uh, you know, how close you are to whatever property you want, uh, collinearity or associativity. So, uh, the conclusion of your theorem uh, says that epsilon goes to zero is delta. Yeah. But if there was, uh, if, if there was a epsilon of delta, if there was some such a function. Yeah, what I should have made clear. What I should have made, I th the amount of associativity in these rounded operations is independent of delta. So no matter which delta you choose, so you choose some very fine net, you still got sort of 1% of the tuples associative. Okay. Does that, does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, it answers because uh, yeah. what we need to, yeah, what epsilon needs to depend on is the fraction of associative per, uh, triples. Yeah. And uh, you're saying this is, let's say one in a hundred for any delta. Yeah, so that, that, that's so, probably, okay. exactly, so a better way of, well, a consequence of this theorem 
is that there exist arbitrarily large examples, capital X, where you've got sort of 1% associativity. And as the examples get larger, the nearness to a group becomes ever more negligible. Yeah. Okay, that's clear, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's the theorem I want to discuss the proof of. Now, the rest of the talk will presuppose some familiarity with additive combinatorics some of the time, um, not all of the time, but I'm going to assume some. Um, right, so let me first of all explain how the proof of this theorem can be reduced to a question in additive combinatorics. Uh, additive combinatorics is a misnomer for this, really. There's nothing additive going on. It's all multiplicative in group operations. So here's, here's the argument. Suppose I have an embedding iota from this set X to a group G, which does respect a proportion epsilon of the pairs X1, X2. So in other words, the, it, it takes the circle operation, which is this weird rounding operation, to the group operation on G, a positive fraction of the time. Then you can do a straightforward cauchy schwarz argument, easy exercise, tells you that there are many quadruples, X1, X2, X3, and X4, uh, with the following list of properties. So I, I, iota of x1 dot iota of x2 equals iota of x1 circle x2 equals iota of x3 circle x4 equals iota of x3 dot iota of x4. So that's not hard to do. So let's let A be the image of this, of our set X in the group G. So that's some finite set that's in the embedded version of X in G. And then iota, because it's an injective, it has an inverse on A, and I'll call that F. So this is a map from A to SO3. And what you can check is that if I've got a tuple X1, X2, and X3, X4 satisfying that equation one, then a couple of things happen. So if I look at the, if I write AI for the image of XI under iota, so I've got A1, A2, A3, and A4, then first of all, A1, A2 equals um, A3 dot A4. I don't know if you can see my cursor. So that's because this equals this. We can see it. Good. And also F of A1 circle F of A2 equals F of A3 circle F of A4. And that comes from the middle bit here, together with the fact that iota is injective. OK. But also, from the definition of the circle operation, from just the very basic definition of what it is, the distance in SO3 from F of A1 circle F of A2 to F of A1 juxtaposition F of A2, so that's the operation on SO3, and the similar thing with A3 and A4, they're at most delta. So if you put that together with the display, the, the equation that I called two, you get the following. So you get that a1 dot a2 equals a3 dot a4, and the distance from f of a1 to f of a2 to f of a3, f of a4 is at most two delta. And this happens for many quadruples a1, a2, a3, and a4. So what's been gained here? Well, the thing that's been, the most important thing that's been gained is that we no longer see this weird rounding operation circle. So that does not appear in this last displayed equation here. And we've got some kind of an approximate homomorphism, which is the sort of thing that additive combinatorialists have methods for dealing with. Unfortunately, though, it's a somewhat unpleasant one. First of all, it, its domain is highly, we have no idea what its domain is. It's some subset of an arbitrary group. I don't know what that group is. It's only a homomorphism some of the time. Um, for some positive fraction of the pairs A1, A2, A3, and A4 satisfying this. And also it's a, a pretty bad kind of homomorphism in that it, ha it has this error in the range of delta as well. But it turns out that tolerating all of these bad things is better than having to worry ex about the, this operation circle. So this really nothing more than cauchy schwarz and the definition is how we reduce things to a problem that at least looks like the kind of thing that people in additive combinatorics think about. So just uh, 
to the additive combinatorics, there you would have an, uh, uh, an approximate homomorphism where delta would be zero. That's the typical situation in the additive combinatorics. For a large fraction of, I know, pairs to a group or something, you would have, uh, uh, but not for all, you would have a F would be, would look like a homomorphism. Exactly. So actually, I'm going to come to that on the next slide. So that's exactly right. So if delta was zero, and also usually we'd want G to be something that we understand, something abelian like Z, then this really would be a pure additive combinatorics question. And you could apply things like balog separated gauss theorem and Freiman's theorem. So let me come to that now, actually. Well, let me just say a couple, let me just follow up on that last slide. So what this says is that if the main theorem is false, then there's some epsilon greater than zero, which I'll think of as fixed from now on, such that the following setup exists for arbitrarily small values of delta. So there's a group G, a set A and G of size roughly delta to the minus three. So this is the image of um, our set X under the embedding. And there's a map F from A to SO3, such that for many quadruples A1, A2, A3, A4, First of all, they are what we call multiplicative quadruples in this sense. And secondly, they are kind of respected by F. So they sort of, F is weakly homomorphic on them up to an error in the range of delta. So we have this setup. And what I want to show is that that can't happen. So actually moreover, I should say, the image of F is delta separated and therefore big. So X, Remember X was a, a maximal delta net in SO3. And so the image of this set A, which is just X, if you thicken it up by delta, it's got full measure. So the plan for the rest of the talk is to explain why these two statements are mutually contradictory. So you cannot have an approximate homomorphism like this into SO3 from any group G. So now, so I'm going to suppose henceforth that, that I have this setup and that F does satisfy both of these conditions. So now let me uh, say what Avi was basically just saying. There's a standard setup that basically due to Ruja, but also sort of formalized by Gowers, an, an important part of Gowers' work on Semerades' theorem. So you have an approximate homomorphism F from a set A to G. So as Abby says, what that would normally mean is that you've got many quadruples A1, A2, A3, and A4, with A1 times A2 equals A3 times A4, um, with the property that F of A1 times F of A2 equals F of 3, A3 times F of A4. So this is equivalent to saying that the graph, so that's literally the, the high school definition of graph, the set of pairs A, F of A, that has large additive energy. So in other words, that has many multiplicative quadruples, many solutions to x1 times x2 equals x3 times x4. Uh, question. Uh, yes. Then. Is g on this slide really s of 3? Um, well, it could be. I'm just talking about the sort of general setup that is standard additive combinatorics to deal with. Right, but G was used before as the, the home of A. Um, oh yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, this, this G is-, is, yes, is It's the local variable G here. It has nothing to do with what we discussed before. So what, the other thing, I'm just gonna turn the light on. It's got dark outside whilst I'm talking. That's better, see if I can, right. Um, yeah, so sorry, different G. Um, okay, so there's something called the balog separated gauss theorem that lets you go from large additive energy to small doubling. So I'm, I'm assuming that people have some background of additive combinatorics for this part of the talk. Um, and if you have small doubling, then there's an argument of Ruja that says that you are a homomorphism on a prime to the four. So here A prime is a positive density subset of A up to a bounded error set. Um, 
which means something like that f of x y differs from f of x times f of y on only a bounded set. So what one's done here is somehow move the approximateness in the domain. So the fact that you've only got the homomorphism property on some proportion of tuples to an approximateness in the range. So f is a homomorphism up to an error. Okay, so that is a sort of standard set of ideas in analytic combinatorics. And it turns out that it, although Ruger and Gowers did it in the abelian case, Tau observed that more or less the same thing works with the same proofs without the assumption of commutativity. And also you can carry an error in the range. So you can weaken this notion of an approximate homomorphism to allow things to go wrong by a delta in the range. You can just carry all of that throughout the argument and, and still get something like the result. So as I said, I'm not assuming that everybody's up on all of the details here at all. So I just want to tell you what the result of applying this standard paradigm is. So this is something you can read out of Tao's paper. What I've written here is just a general piece of definition. This is called the, a co-cycle. So if you've got a map phi in two variables, uh, with taking values in a group, I shall write partial phi will mean phi of y inverse phi of x inverse phi of xy. So this is this co-cycle is going to measure somehow the distance between phi of xy and phi of x times phi of y. So the upshot of applying this machine of additive combinatorics to the situation I had, the situation arising from this rounding to a net in SO3 is the following. So there's an approximate group B. And again, if you don't know what an approximate group is, that doesn't matter too much. It's basically something that's weakly closed under multiplication. So it's a subset of a group that's not a subgroup, but it's not too far off being a subgroup. And there's a map from B to the 12. Again, the 12 is not terribly important there. So there's a map from B to the 12 to SO3 and a set S in SO3 of bounded size such that the following is true. Whenever x, y, and x times y lie in this b of b to the 12, phi is a homomorphism up to errors in this bounded set s and of size at most delta. So I've written it in terms of the co-cycle. So the distance, so phi of x, y differs from phi of x times phi of y in something that is in this bounded set s or and very small. So we have this sort of weak homomorphism property. Uh, but a few things have been achieved here in that the domain here, this B, is not an arbitrary set anymore. It's weakly closed under multiplication. And we no longer have this ambiguity in the domain. So we now have the homomorphism, this admittedly weak homomorphism property, but we have it for all X and Y. So that's much better than having it for a positive proportion of x and y. So just to repeat, that's what comes out of the additive combinatorics machinery, which I don't really want to go into the details of. Moreover, this map still has thick image. So if you thicken up the image of this phi uh, in SO3, it's still got almost full measure. And I want to show that that can't exist. So that is a reduction of the question I had before. Yeah, I have a question. So yeah. uh, we should think of phi as what was f before, roughly. Yeah, exactly. I didn't want to say it's not exactly f, but it's basically f. It, it, it's f has been used to define phi. And the size of s is independent of, uh, um, so b is, is what will grow with delta, right? Uh, exactly. And, exactly. Uh, so the, this, this, this very large set, but uh, S is still a constant size that's independent of that. Exactly. So, so this 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 phi is a homomorphism up to two types of error: those that are small in, in the metric sense, and just some bounded set of ambiguities that's just uniformly bounded, not depending on delta or anything. So, just think of it as some set of size a hundred or something like that. Okay, so I want to show, is that, yeah? 
I want to show that there can be no such man. And there are two quite different modes of argument um, according to the following two cases. So case one is where this co-cycle, so this is the discrepancy between 5xy and 5x times 5y, takes at least one value that's far from the identity. So if phi were a genuine homomorphism, the co-cycle would be trivial everywhere, would be exactly the identity. So this is somehow saying that at least somewhere, it's far from being a genuine homomorphism. And then the second case is that for all x and y, this co-cycle is close to the identity. So there are quite different arguments in the two cases. And I just want to give a hint, maybe without too many details of what goes into the two cases, because I think there are some links with interesting parts of maths in, in both of them. So we'll look at case one first. So case one is the case where at least for one pair x and y, this co-cycle, the discrepancy between 5xy and 5x times 5y is far from the identity. So fix those x and y and let a be the co-cycle and just take an arbitrary z. So all of these things lie in the approximate group B or B to the four, but don't worry too much about that. Then we just write down this co-cycle relation, which is something that, well, I guess ultimately it comes from group cohomology. Um, but it's what it's saying is that every co-boundary is a co-cycle, but this is just an identity that you can verify. So it says that the conjugate of A by phi of Z is the product of three co-cycles. And what that means, because those co-cycles, by assumption, all take values close to S, well, this means that the conjugate of A by phi of Z takes values close to S times S times S. Now, S is a set of just fixed size, like 100. And so I can pick, let's say, 100 elements, Z1 up to Zk, such that the conjugate of A by phi of Z is always close to the conjugate of A by one of those phi of Zi's for some i. Now, if you're not sort of super familiar with this, these kind of group theory calculations, what this means, it's equivalent to saying that A almost commutes with B, where B depends on Z, is, is phi of Z times phi of Zi inverse. So we have a situation where we've shown that this a, which is the value of the co-cycle at x, y, almost commutes with all of these elements b, which depend on an arbitrary z. So this leads us very quickly to uh, that's a question. question. Can you go back? Yeah. yeah. Where well, did we use here the large distance from the identity? We haven't. This would be true always, but we're going to use it because let's say a was equal to the identity, this would tell us nothing. So if a was equal to the identity, it's always the case that ab is close to ba. So whilst what I've written is true, it would be of no use unless a is far from the identity. Okay. Yeah, so we need to study almost commutators. And I know there are some people in this talk who have studied this kind of thing and maybe so I have, a, I have a reference request actually for those people. So here, here's what we want to show. Suppose that A and B are in SO3. I want to show that if AB is close to BA, then B is close to something that commutes with A. So that's not a tautology, right? So distance from A, AB to BA is small, implies that I can perturb B a little bit to something that genuinely commutes with A. So here's a lemma that I proved that, I mean, it, it's pretty straightforward just using some computations with Euler angles. And I feel it really should be in the literature. And I bet it is in the literature, but I don't know of a reference. So if somebody could help me with that, I would be happy. So let's take two elements of SO3. And then this is a precise form of what I just said. So if you, it's saying that essentially if, if AB is close to BA, and if A is not too close to the identity, then B is close to something that commutes with A. So C of A here is the centralizer of, of A, the set of things that commute with A. 
Okay, so we've got that lemma. It's, it's not too hard. Um, let's just go back to where we were before and see what this gives us. So we had, this is the situation we were in. We had A, which was a co-cycle, and it was far from the identity. And we'd shown that for all Z in our approximate group B, to the four, there's some bounded list of Zi's such that this equation here is true. So A almost commutes with phi of Z, phi of Zi inverse. But now I know that this implies that those phi of Z, phi of Zi inverses are close to the centralizer of A. But if you've got an element that's not close to the identity in SO3, its centralizer is kind of a co-dimension two thing. So that's a small set. And in particular, if you thicken it up by delta, you don't get anywhere near um, the whole of the group. So this places the image of phi inside a very thin set. And that's contrary to our assumption. So that deals with the case where you have a co-cycle that's large. So any questions on that? I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to move on from this after to talk about something else. Any references for this kind of a lemma? Okay. So that's the end of case one. So let's recall what case two was. So now all of these co-cycles are small. So what we have is the following situation. We have an approximate group B and we have a map phi from B or in fact from B to the 12 to SO3, which really does look like an almost homomorphism. So for all X and Y, wherever this is defined, the distance from phi of X to Y to phi of X times phi of Y is less than square root delta. So it really does feel like an approximate homomorphism from B to SO3. And what I want to show is that any map phi with this property has thin image, and that will be my final contradiction. So now I'm going to talk in much rougher terms. I'm going to just abandon, I'm not going to carry any deltas around with me anymore. I'll just use this catch-all approximate notation. And I'm also going to stop pretending that I'm serious about the difference between B to the four and B to the 12. So I've just got an approximate group B, a map phi from B into SO3, and it's an almost homomorphism in the sense that phi of XY is roughly phi of X times phi of Y, where roughly is sort of up to, means up to square root delta, but let's not worry too much about that. So there are now a lot of steps that we're going to take involving importing some non-trivial facts. And the first is, is quite a deep fact that Emmanuel Bruyard, Terry Tao and I established about 10 years ago, which is about the structure of approximate groups. So at the moment, this B, as I've said, it's, it's an approximate group, which means it's sort of weakly closed under multiplication, but we don't know anything about where it sits. It sits inside some arbitrary group G that we don't know anything about. But there is this classification that says that B is nilpotent up to a finite group. So more precisely, B contains a subgroup H such that, the quote, such that H is normal and the quotient B mod H is nilpotent of bounded rank. So that's a, a pretty difficult theorem. So now let's exploit that nilpotence. So we can start taking commutators of elements. Um, so we're just going to keep taking commutators of, of elements in B. And so we'll start with the, the first commutator, W1 of AB is the commutator of AB. So that's AB, A inverse, B inverse. And then just keep taking commutators. So the I plus first commutator is the commutator of A with the ith commutator. Then after we've done this S times by the definition of nilpotence, that S order commutator is trivial in B over H because that's a nilpotent group. And therefore that word WS of X and Y lies in this subgroup H for all X and Y in B. So that's using the nilpotence. Now we use this approximate homomorphism property 
And that works very well with words. So phi of x, y is approximately phi of x, phi of y for all x and y. Then phi of x, y, z is approximately phi of x, phi of y, phi of z for all x, y, and z, etc. I mean, the notion of approximate gets slightly worse as you keep doing that, but I'm going to brush that under the carpet. So if you just use that property a lot, you can basically commute words with this phi. So phi of this particular word, ws of x and y, is roughly ws of phi of x, phi of y. So what this means is that this big commutator word of phi of x, phi of y lies close to phi of h. Now, so what does, what does this phi look like restricted to h? So h is a genuine subgroup. So we're really now doing group theory rather than additive combinatorics. And there's a celebrated result of Kajdan, uh, related work of, of Grove and Karsha and Rue, and also actually something by Alan Turing from the 30s that's quite closely related to this as well. So H is genuinely a group, and phi restricts to an approximate homomorphism on H. And this result of Kajdan says that you can correct any homomorphism from a finite group H into SO3, for example, uh, to a genuine homomorphism. So there's a, a genuine homomorphism phi tilde. So that means phi tilde of H1, H2 is actually equal to phi tilde of H1 times phi tilde of H2, which is close point-wise to phi. Okay, so we've imported a couple of substantial facts here, the classification of approximate groups by Emmanuel Terry and myself, and this result of, of Kajdan on approximate homomorphisms. A question, uh, Dan. Yeah. How general is this Kajdan uh, result for what, which groups uh, is, does it hold besides SO3? Um, I think it holds for... Uh, it holds for amen amenable groups in general, not just finite, and even with the same constant. And there is a very interesting result, so Burger, Java, and Tom, which actually prove it also for SLNZ, for N, it's not true for the free group, but it's true for SLNZ for N greater or equal uh, three, surprisingly. Yeah. So it I will come eventually, it, uh, it, this will come eventually in my stability seminar at some point later on in the year. It's real, it, everything is related. So it's, yeah, I mean, obviously Alex knows vastly more than me about this. The actual paper of Kajdan, I think, right, applies to amenable, certainly to any Lie group, I think. In, 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 no, in any any uh, Hilbert space, whenever it acts on any Hilbert space, even infinite dimensional, uh, the results I mentioned, and also what you need here, are only when you have homomorphism to finite dimensional Hilbert space. And it's really a difference. It's not true for SLNZ for infinite dimensional, but you don't care what you need here is only, is only finite dimensional, which is fine. Yeah, so by the way, this paper of Kashan is, is it's not too long, it's very readable. And it's a very beautiful argument that I think some people call co-cycle straightening. You kind of just gradually make the co-cycle smaller and smaller until it disappears. Yeah. Recommend it. Um, okay. Last slide that I'm going to cover. So what we've got to at this point is, okay. So this phi tilde, which is close to phi, is a genuine homomorphism and H is a finite group. So the image of a finite group under a homomorphism is of course another finite group. So we've got a, its image is a finite subgroup of SO3 and finite subgroups of SO3 are classified easily. So they are cyclic dihedral or subgroup of S5. And I mean, you don't really need to classify them to have a result like this. I think the result, again, Alex is the real expert on this, but all we need is that there is a word W star in two letters, which is trivial on G cross G for all uniformly over all finite subgroups G of SO3. And I've written down an explicit word that would do this uh, based on the fact on the classification of them all as cyclic dihedral or, or subgroups of S5. Okay, so now you essentially can combine this 
W star with the commutative words WS that I already had. And the commutative words take you near to H, phi of H. And then this W star is basically trivial on that. And so I've now got a word W in four letters that's almost trivial on the whole of the image of my approximate group B under phi. But remember that I want this, this is pretty clearly going to lead to a contradiction because I'm also assuming that this image phi of B is dense in SO3. So we know that SO3 contains three subgroups. And so you know, we kind of know um, that it doesn't, there are no words that almost vanish on it. So to conclude the proof, that's what we need to show. So we need to show that the measure of four tuples of SO3, such that this word, W of Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, is within eta of the identity, tends to zero as eta tends to zero. And just by measure theory, this is equivalent to saying that the measure of the set of tuples in SO3 uh, where this word is trivial is zero. But that's a known fact. Um, so almost every quadruple of elements of SO3, in fact, generates a free group. But once you've even got one quadruple of elements that generates a free group, this W then gives you a non-trivial algebraic relation on SO3. And so the set of quadruples y1, y2, y3, y4, where that's trivial, will be of positive co-dimension. OK, so that's, that's the end of the proof. And um, I think I'll stop there, actually. Thank you. OK, great. Thanks, uh, Ben, and uh, for everybody. Um, so questions to Ben. Yeah, if I can. I mean, uh, SO3 really, I mean, uh, every, uh, if I didn't miss something, that uh, this would work for every simple legal, uh, compact simple Lee group, right? I mean, the last point is, is the only place where you really mention SO3, and this is uh, uh, easily true for others by Jordan theorem, for example. Um, I, yeah. well, there was SO3 somewhere anywhere? There uh, was. So I agree with you. Everything in these last few slides whilst it was a little specific to SO3, there are certainly variants of it known for, for other things. I mean, one could be explicit about the classification of finite subgroups of SO3, whereas you can't for bigger Lie groups. No, 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 no but, but you don't need, you don't no, need- No, you don't need to, I know. I, 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 there is this uh, classic 19th century Jordan theorem. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, yeah. I, so I suspect you're right. You, you could do it for every simple Lie group, but there is also this point here this thing, lemma about almost commutators that I assume is known or doable for other simple Lie groups. But I, my argument for this was very explicit with Euler angles on SO3. So I'm sure it could be done if you had to, but the this bit was quite specific to SO3. Well, the kind of results I know uh, is that uh, if you fix N, now you look at say SON and you fix N, if A and B almost commute, then you can move both of them a little bit so that they commute. Now you want to fix one and, and move only the other. Yeah. Because you, right? Um, there is a result like that for permutation group by Gorenstein, I believe, and some other people. Um, yeah, okay, this, I don't know right or from the end of my talk uh, from the yeah so I mean, if you don't know if you don't know that it may not exist i mean i i certainly had a bit of a look at the literature on almost commuting elements in groups and i i couldn't find at least anything that i could quote on this mm -hmm. but don't you know don't you need at least compactness of the group i mean even for gowers and long's example to make sense to have a Almost to have a delta net, to have almost transitivity or almost associativity, you want to sure. talk about groups which are compact, first of all, right? Yeah, but I, th I think, I mean, I think Alex is sort of mor compact. morally right that. that ah, it, okay, so it's a compact, yeah. I think probably we've made not, haven't made much really serious use of SO3 apart from possibly here.
More questions? So, uh, are you still working on this uh, cubic, uh, the original geometric uh, question? No, I mean, I haven't thought about it recently. The, as I said, this broad strategy of trying to do it via almost associativity, it's very hard to even see how one would start. I mean, a configuration, there's this thing called the group co configuration. I mean, you know, some, something like, uh, well, you can, you can write down finite sets of points that encode associativity of a, of a collinearity operation. And even showing that there are many of them just from the assumption that there are many collinear triples is, doesn't seem obvious at all. So I, I don't even know how to start. I don't, uh, yeah. And regarding this, uh, well, we, uh, there was a question in the beginning. Uh, if you assume both almost commutativity and almost associativity, uh, is it possible that then uh, there's no negative result and you can always approximate it by? Yeah, uh, so I have to defer to Gowers and Long on this. I believe they have some work in progress. I don't know what what it states. What certainly I've, I've convinced myself of is that these sort of rounding operations, if you take an abelian Lie group and try and do a rounding from a net, you will always be close to a group operation. So I sort of suspect there aren't any abelian properly, if you formulate it the right way, there probably aren't any abelian counterexamples, that'd be my guess. Okay, more questions to Ben. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>